Shalom. This is Calvin Israel, back with another video lesson, giving all praises, honor, power, glory, dominion, majesty, reverence, blessings, worship, love, and admiration to the Most High, Yahweh, and Yahweh only. Double honors, triple honors to Yahweh, and Yahweh only. No Baha Shem. Understand that. All right. Now, today's video lesson is going to be more of a wise counsel, more of a scripture study. So let's have a Tanakh study and let's figure out what is a Mamzer. Right. What is a mamzer? What is a bastard? What is the fate of a bastard, a mamzer? All right. All right. Let's see. Who is a mamzer? Who is a bastard? And what is the fate? Of them. Deuteronomy 23, verse 2. Now study with me. We just studying. We're trying to figure out what is going on here. Because this is another debate. This is a debate that a lot of Israelites are having. You got a group of Israelites that think it's okay to marry heathen women, strange wives, and they got scriptures that they use to say that it's okay and that it doesn't matter who the mother is. It only matters who the father is because the father's seed determines the nationality of the child. All right. Then you got on the other hand, you got Israelites. That's saying. It's forbidden. And. If. You do marry a heathen wife. And have children with these heathens. Then the child is not an Israelite. The child is a bastard. He's a mamzer. He's not pure. And he is not an heir of our inheritance. Um, well, let's get into it. Let's get into it. And let's just study and figure out you know, what the scriptures is telling us, you know, and through the power and the spirit of the most high, you know, with the knowledge that he bestowed upon us, we're going to figure this out with the scriptures that we have. Let's look closely. Let's dig deep. Let's get muddy with these scriptures, man. Grave diggers, Y O Z. Deuteronomy 23 and 2. A bastard shall not enter into the congregation of Yahweh, even to his tenth generation, shall he not enter into the congregation of Yahweh. So even after the 10th generation, after the 10th generation. This child, this bastard child, shall not enter the congregation of the Most High. What is the congregation of the Most High? It's the priesthood, the Levitical priesthood of the Levites. 
so he won't be able to enter the congregation. All right. Um, which means he won't be able to attend worship services. He won't be able to bring sacrifices to the Most High. Okay, so, you know, that's what it means. He can't enter the congregation. You know, the temple. He probably most likely will have to uh, worship outside the temple, you know, as uh, other strangers and other heathens do. They have to worship outside the temple. Outside the congregation. Basically, this child is not close to the Most High. And the Most High don't want this child close to him. Or this person. So, let's see. Let's read it again. Deuteronomy 23, verse 2. A bastard shall not enter into the congregation of Yahweh, even to his 10th generation shall he not enter into the congregation of Yahweh. So that's basically saying forever. If let's look at, let's just look at the definition. We're going to go into the Hebrew and look at the definition of bastard. Okay. So we go here. And it says, Strong's H4464. Strong's H4464. Mamzer. 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 Okay. Let's look up the definition. Mamzer. From an unused root meaning to alienate a mongrel born of a Jewish father and a heathen mother, bastard. Okay, so born from an Israelite father and a heathen mother, bastard. So that's what bastard means. A mixed person. Okay. You know, and um, I'm not trying to play either side here. We're just trying to figure out the truth. Right? So. Even to his 10th generation shall he not enter into the congregation of Yahweh. Well, um, this generation means, okay, if a man, an Israelite man, has a child with a heathen woman, that child is one generation. When that child has a child, that would be the second generation. And so on and so on and so on to the 10th generation. And even after the 10th generation, that seed line is ruined. It's not accepted. It's not accepted into the congregation of the Most High. All right. So is it any good news for a bastard, a mamzer, someone that is born from an Israelite father and a heathen mother, you know, or vice versa? Uh, is it any any hope? Yeah, it is. 
there's hope. If this Mamzer takes hold of the covenant and keeps the commandments and serve the most high, you know, then in the kingdom to come, this is what the most high will do. Isaiah 4, verse 4. When Yahweh shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and shall have purged the blood of Jerusalem from the midst thereof by the spirit of judgment and by the spirit of burning. So we see that the Most High says that he's going to purge the blood, purify the blood of Jerusalem. And we understand that reading this in context that, you know, this is about the kingdom to come, the afterlife. Okay. So. If you are a pure blooded. Israelite got an Israelite father, Israelite mother, your blood don't need to be purified. Your blood don't need to be purged. You're pure. You have 100% royal blood. This is talking about people that are mixed. Mamzers. So. You will purge the blood. All right. So. Purging the blood, purging out, purifying the blood, purging out all of that heathen blood, making you a pure Israelite. So if you are mixed, don't worry about it. Just keep praising the most high. You know, like the scripture says, let everything that has breath praise Yahweh. Okay, and uh, you will be rewarded. Your blood will be purged. Just keep praising the most high. All right. But as far as in this current world, this current reality that we're living in, we see that a mamzer is frowned upon. He's uh, he's rejected. Uh, he's uh, alienated, you know, kind of isolated. Uh, he's a misfit, an outcast. All right, so on the other hand, Israelites that believe that they can have sex with you know, the whole world, except for the nations that were named in Deuteronomy 7, right? Let's get that. Because they say that, you know, it's the seed line of your father. You know, what we see right here, you know, he's not purging the seed, you know, it's the blood. Well, let's get that first. Because... It's the blood of a thing. The life is in the blood. Let's go to Leviticus 17. He's going to purge the blood, not the seed. Because... Leviticus 17 and 11, for the life of the flesh is in the blood 
and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that maketh atonement for the soul. So we see that this is in context talking about animal sacrifice. But, you know, we get a message here that for the life of the flesh is in the blood. And we understand that to be true. Because we see what happens when blood is mixed. It changes the appearance of someone, you know. You know, uh, if you want to do a DNA test, blood is required. If you want to do, you know, if you want to find out who the father of a child is, you take a blood sample, not a sperm sample. All right. So you can't say that it's the seed. It really doesn't make any sense to say that it's the seed that determines the nationality of a child when it's evident that that child is blood related to the mother and the mother is a heathen. If you were to say that it is the seed that determines the nationality of the child, then you will also have to say that the child is not blood related to the mother. But if you take a blood test, you can find out that the child is related to the mother. It's DNA mixed. Leviticus 17 and 14. For it is the life of all flesh. The blood of it is for the life thereof. All flesh. The blood. For it is the blood of all flesh. The blood of it is for the life thereof. Therefore I said unto the children of Israel, ye shall eat the blood of no manner of flesh. For the life of all flesh is the blood thereof. Whosoever eat it shall be cut off. So there you have it. Life is in the blood. The blood determines the thing, not the sperm. It's, life is not in the sperm. It's in the blood. All right. But Israelites on the other hand, we're going to call them the red Israelites. Okay. The red Israelites that think that they can have sex with the whole world, except for these nations that are named in Deuteronomy seven and have children with these nations and the children will still be Israelites regardless of the mother. And we'll say that the Israelites that disagree with that are the blue Israelites. All right. Deuteronomy 7 and 1. When Yahweh, your God, shall bring you into the land, whether you goeth to possess it and has cast out many nations before you, the Hittites and the Jergashites and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, seven nations 
greater and mightier than you. And when Yahweh, your God, shall deliver them before you, you shall smite them and utterly destroy them. You shall make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them. Neither shall you make marriages with them. Your daughter, you shall not give unto his son, nor his daughter shall you take unto your son. Okay, so we see, we see here of what the red Israelites are saying. They saying that these are the only nations that are off limits or forbidden to make marriages with. Because it didn't name, it didn't list any other nations besides the nations that are listed right here in Deuteronomy 7 and 1. But reading this in context, it says, When Yahweh your God shall bring you into the land where you go is to possess it. Right? So, this is Yahweh telling the Israelites, look, when you go into the promised land, it's going to be other nations that live there. Don't think that it's cool to just make covenants with them, make friends with them. Don't think that it's cool to make marriages with them. Just like it's not cool for you to marry these other nations that we defeated on our way to the promised land. When you get to the promised land, it's the same thing with these nations that's going to be in the promised land. The Howa is telling you that these nations are going to be in the promised land and to not show mercy on them, do not make friends with them, do not make marriages with them, destroy them and drive them out. That's all, it, that's all it's saying. When you go into this land, don't think that you're supposed to dwell among them. Don't think that you're supposed to be cool with them. You know, them too, you are not to be joined unto. Why? For they will turn away your son from following me, that they may serve other gods. So will the anger of Yahweh will be kindled against you and destroy you suddenly. So this is why Yahweh doesn't want us to join with other nations. You know, is these seven nations right here in Deuteronomy 7 and 1 is the only nation that can turn us away from Yahweh to serve their gods or turn our children away from Yahweh to serve their gods? No. Other nations that are not listed here in Deuteronomy 7 and 1 has that ability too. He's giving you the reason. This is the reason why you shouldn't do that. This is the reason why we should not mix with other nations. The nations will turn our children away from Yahweh which will weaken us. Listen, the gods of the nations are idols. Okay? They worship idols as gods. 
So this is the reason why Yahweh said, do not do this. Because you might say, well, I converted the wife. You know, the heathen wife, she serves Yahweh. Yeah. And as long as she's with you, she will serve Yahweh. Or make you believe that she's serving Yahweh. But she really doesn't have the spirit to serve Yahweh. She has the spirit of a heathen to be a heathen. Okay. And her family is not converted. We can say that she's fully converted and she fully gave her heart to Yahweh. But her family, once the child go around her family and go around his cousins on that side, they're going to be teaching him their customs, their ways, their traditions. All right. Unless she's your full slave and you gained possession of her through battle and you didn't killed her father and mother and her family and now she's all the way yours. All right, and that's exactly what we see here in Deuteronomy 21. Let's go to Deuteronomy 21. Let me bring that out. Deuteronomy 21 and 10. And this is the only way that it is allowed for us to go into a heathen woman. When you go with, this is Deuteronomy 21 and 10. When you go with forth to war against your enemies and yet how will your God has delivered them into your hands and has taken them captive. All right, so this is an act of war. All right. We they we we won the war. Yahweh allowed us to win the war. He delivered them into our hands and we have taken them captive, which means it's a lot of dead bodies. And pretty much only thing left is the spoil, the booty, the women, the gold all of the riches and resources that that nation had. All right. So, yeah. And seeth among the captives a beautiful woman and has a desire unto her that thou wouldest have her to thy wife. Okay. Now the scripture says wife, you know. But sometimes the scripture uses wife, but it means concubine or it means a handmaid. Either way, she's still considered somewhat of your wife because you're having sex with her. She can't have sex with anyone else once you have sex with her. So she is your wife. Okay. Rather, if she's a slave. Or not doesn't mean you have to treat her like equally as your loving Israelite wife, but she's still in all a wife. Then thou shalt bring her home to thine house, and she shall shave her head and pare her nails. Now we don't see any of the red Israelites. Taking these heathen women and shaving their heads. We don't see that. We don't see these women walking around bald headed. You know what I mean? You take her pride from her when you do that. You take her pride. You take her. Uh, her confidence. Her glory. You take that from her. You shave her head off. You shave her hair off. You shave her head. So she can't be just 
among your Israelite wives, thinking that she on a level, just swinging her long heathen hair, you know? Oh, you put her to shame, right? And she shall put the raiment of her captivity from off her and shall remain in thine house and be well her father and her mother a full month. So we see here, you see, she's mourning for her father and mother and her family because they were all killed. They were all killed in war. The whole nation was destroyed. The whole nation was conquered. This is the only way that it is legal. Right? This is the only way that it is legal. And she shall put the raiment of her captivity from off her and shall remain in thine house and be well her father and her mother a full month. And after that, thou shalt go in unto her and be her husband and she shall be thy wife. And it shall be if thou have no delight in her, then thou shalt let her go whether she will. But thou shalt not sell her at all for money. Thou shalt not make merchandise of her. Why? Why you can't pimp her out? Because thou has humbled her. That's why. You can't sell her for money. You can't make merchandise of her. Why? Why you can't pimp her? Because thou has humbled her. We had sex with her already. So we see here in the scriptures, you can have heathen prostitutes as long as you're not having sex with them because that'd be unclean having sex with prostitutes after, you know, they, you're selling her for merchandise. She's sleeping with all these other men. But we see that you can have prostitutes. You just can't sleep with the prostitute yourself. Yeah, heathen prostitutes, you know, it's a commandment that we shall not make whores of the daughters of Zion. You can't pimp out an Israelite woman. You can't sell an Israelite woman for merchandise you can't make. You can't make a whore out of her. You know, exploit her, you know, degrade her, have her stripping for you and your in your in your buddies. <laughs> You and your brothers just throwing dollar bills at Israelites, man. That's wicked. You know, that's a heathen's job. A heathen woman. You can do that. You know, I'm supposed to do that to the daughters of Zion. All right. So, yeah, in this condition, it will be OK. She will have no family to take. She will have no family. To take the child to and the family members on her side can influence the child. Or if anything happened to you, you die in battle or something. She takes the kid back to her family and her family convert her back. And the child is the child is rotten, is ruined with idolatry. And all kind of abominations. All right. But if you had an Israelite wife. If anything happened to you. She go back to her family. That believed the same thing that you believe. Serving you how well only. And that's. That's why we keep it in our nation. All right. So. going on here let's see if this is in context or is this a context a context switch within a chapter if a man have two wives one beloved and another hated and they have borne him children both the beloved 
and to hate it. And if the firstborn son be hers that was hated, then it shall be when he maketh his son to inherit that which he has, that he may not make the son of the beloved firstborn before the son of the hated, which is indeed the firstborn. But he shall acknowledge the son of the hated for the firstborn by giving him a double portion of all that he has. For he is the beginning of his strength. The right of the firstborn is his. Okay. So now with this reading in context. That. The firstborn is actually born of a Israelite woman and a heathen woman. Is that what this talking about? Is it talking about a heathen woman and an Israelite woman? Because the Israelite woman being the beloved and the heathen woman being the hated. Is that what this is talking about? Because if that's what this is talking about, then we see that a bastard, a mamzer, indeed is an Israelite. He has rights to the throne. He has rights to the inheritance. Right? Now, if this is a context switch, and it's just talking about two wives that are Israelites, one that you like more, one that you don't like so much for whatever reason. She could be a nag. But is it talking about that? Well, let's see. Let's see if the Israelites, you know, agree with that. Um... Let's go to Ezra. Ezra 10 and 1. Ezra chapter 10 verse 1. Now when Ezra had prayed. And when he had confessed weeping and casting himself down before the house of God. There assembled unto him out of Israel a very great congregation of men and women and children, for the people wept very sore. And Shechaniah, the son of Jehiel, one of the sons of Elam, answered and said unto Ezra, We have trespassed against our God. And have taken strange wives of the people of the land. We have trespassed against our God and have taken strange wives of the people of the land. Yet now there is hope in Israel concerning this thing. So it wasn't even no hope for you. Or the children. It wasn't no hope. For you if you did this. Right. But it's hope now right. What did they come up with. Now therefore. Let us make a covenant with our God. To put away all the wives. And such. As are born of them. According to the counsel. Of my Lord. Wait, what did that say? Now, therefore, let us make a covenant with our God. So here at this point, they're making a covenant with the most high. OK, now, therefore, let us make a covenant with our God to put away all the wives and such as are born of them. 
according to the counsel of my Lord and those that tremble at the commandment of our God and let it be done according to the law. Whoa. And we know what the law is. So going back to Deuteronomy 21 and 10, I guess that was a context switch because there's no way that the Israelites felt that no way they could feel like the children that are born of these strange wives are Israelites because now they're putting away the children. They're casting them out of the land or they're just all out just putting them to death. Now, therefore, let us make a covenant with our God to put away all the wives and such as are born of them, such as are born of them will be the children. All right. So it's clear that the Israelites did not believe that the children that they had with heathen women was considered Israelites. They were considered bastards, and that was according to the law. The law that we read in Deuteronomy 23 and 2. Okay? So, I mean, that pretty much wraps it up right there. That pretty much wraps it up. You know, we can, um, we can come back with a part two. So we just study in here, seeing what we can come up with, you know, and, uh, we pretty much came up with, uh, the truth. We found out that to have foreign wives, strange wives, is forbidden by the law. The only way that it could be done is if you wipe out the whole nation and you take them captives to where the women slaves don't have any family because they were killed off in war but then again still in all if you have children with this slave woman this slave woman's children of yours and hers the children are not considered Israelites because if they were then these Israelites here in Ezra will not be putting away the children. They will put away the wives, but they wouldn't be putting away the children also. And that's just what the scripture says, you know, so, you know, you know, when we piece it together, that's what we see. You know, um, we don't see that. We don't see that you are what your father is. We don't see that. We don't. Where is that here in Ezra ten and three? They would have kept it. They would have kept the children and not put them away. Well, let's go to Nehemiah. Let's go to Nehemiah. Let's go to Nehemiah 13. Nehemiah 13, verse 23. In those days also saw I Jews that had married wives of Ashdod, of Ammon, and of Moab. 
and their children spake half in the speech of Ashdod, and could not speak in the Jews' language, but according to the language of each people. And I contended with them, and cursed them, and smote certain of them, and plucked off their hair, and made them swear by God, saying, Ye shall not give your daughters unto their sons, nor take their daughters unto your sons, or for yourselves. Yo, he was mad, man. Nehemiah was mad. Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin by these things? Yet among many nations was there no king like him who was beloved of his God, and God made him king over all Israel? Nevertheless, even him did outlandish women cause to sin. Right? So Solomon was really loved by the Most High. The Most High showed him so much love. But yet these women still was able to, you know, turn him away from the Most High. Shall we hearken unto you to do all this great evil? So, Israelites are considering this a great evil to be with heathen women, to transgress against our God in marrying strange wives. Mm-hmm. Right? So, let's see. Let's see who did King Solomon marry since only the since the red Israelites, they say that only the women of Deuteronomy 7 was off limits. Only those nations was off limits. And this is saying that Solomon trespassed by marrying strange wives. And he committed a great evil. It's a great evil. Right? So... Let's see. Let's go to let's see let's see the nations that he married. Let's go to one Kings eleven and one. One Kings chapter eleven verse one. But the king but King Solomon loved many strange women together with the daughters of Pharaoh. That's the Egyptians. Women of the Moabites, Chinese, Ammonites, Japanese, Edomites, white people, Zidonians, Africans, Hittites. More Africans. Right? So, but King Solomon loved many strange women together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Zidonians, and Hittites. Of the nations concerning which Yahweh said unto the children of Israel, ye shall not go into them, neither shall they come in unto you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clave unto these in love. So where do we read that? Where do we read that these women, these strange women, will turn our hearts 
from serving the Most High. They will turn us away. We read that in Deuteronomy 7, the very same chapter, that these red Israelites say, only those seven nations were off limits. But here we see that the Israelites had an understanding that all nations were off limits. Because this names more nations that was not on that list. So, like I told you guys, it named those particular nations, those seven nations in Deuteronomy 7. Because in context, it was saying, when you go into this land, when you go into the promised land, these nations are going to be there. Don't think that it's okay to make marriages with these nations, just as it's not okay to make marriages with any other nation. It's not okay to make marriages with these nations that are going to be in the promised land, but you got to drive them out and break their idols and pull down their pillars and burn their groves and everything. That's what it was saying. Okay. So conclusion is let's run down it again. What our studies teaches us is that these heathen women are off limits. These heathen women are not for us. You know, we are not to make marriages with them. We are not to go in unto them. We are not to have children with them. If we do. Because. The most high. Said we could. If. We go to battle with their nation and destroy the whole nation because Yahweh has delivered them into our hands. We are entitled to the booty if Yahweh says we can. We are entitled to the spoil. Then we have to shave the woman's head, pair her nails, you know, and let her mourn her family that died in war for a month then we can go go into her have sex with her and uh, treat her however we please as a, a slave wife or whatever and if we do have a children if a child come from that union then we have to understand that that child is not a pure Israelite it's a mamzer you know, uh, that's just what it is. So that's the conclusion.